Sometimes, and as I was thinking about it this week, there is a disconnect between the first century of what we would say people in the Bible and who we are today. So we would say that, yeah, yeah, I get what they did and that's all good, but, but I got real life here today. I got family issues. So did they. Well, well, I got financial stuff going on. So did they. Well, I got health issues. So did they. And sometimes we have this disconnect from people in the Bible to where we are in this moment, but there's really no disconnect because even though that we are in a different culture, we have different ways of living, the one thing that is constant between the two is the Holy Spirit. And it's not a different Holy Spirit in 2021 than it was in AD 1. Same Holy Spirit. So you have this group of people that have an encounter with Jesus, as we've talked about this multiple times over the last number of weeks. The Holy Spirit literally transformed their lives, but the difference between you and me is that we ask God to get involved in what we're doing, and if it's convenient for us, it's all good. They, instead of saying, God, would you get involved in what I'm doing, they said, God, I want to get involved in what you're doing. Okay, so they revolve their lives around God instead of asking God to revolve himself around them. It makes a difference. Because at that point, it's God's business rather than God getting involved in my business when I want him to. I invite God into every area of my life. Look at somebody and say, invite God into every area of your life. Everything. And so they have this encounter that happens in, in Acts chapter 2. And what's interesting about this is that they didn't really have a strategy. I mean, what are they going to do? The Roman government is against them. All the religious culture is against them. Oh, we're going to have a plan. This is what we do today in the American church. Well, we're going to have a strategy. We're going to have this outreach event going on. We've got this strategy, and this is how we're going to reach people. They had no strategy. They didn't know what they were going to do until the Holy Spirit came and gave them the strategy of what they needed to do. You know, let me tell you what might be better. We might be better for God to show up than figure out what we want to do instead of figure it out before God shows up, huh? Because it, it, their, their plans and strategies weren't designed in a boardroom. They were designed in a prayer room. It came out of an encounter with Christ. Well, we need to do this and we need to do that. No, maybe we need to listen to God and see what he's getting ready to do so we can be part of what he is doing, not asking him to get involved in what we're doing. And the Holy Spirit totally transforms them. And Peter stands up on that day. Remember, he's preaching. And he says, you crucified your own Messiah. And they said, what should we do to be saved? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Repent and be baptized. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, because the, whole, the promise is to you, to anybody who, who the Lord our God will call. And, and in that morning, 3,000 people are saved. He, wasn't, he didn't get up that morning planning on preaching. He didn't get up that morning planning on having a crusade. He didn't get up that morning really planning on anything. They were just hanging out. They were praying together, and God showed up. Then when God showed up, God showed them what to do. 3,000 people come to Christ. Now watch, watch what this does, because everything now is going to be transformed. Here's the question that I want us to ask today. Has your life been transformed by anything that is supernatural, or are you just kind of living life the way that it is? I will tell you some of the most Miserable people in church are those people that are just doing their thing and hopefully maybe God might show up. I'm telling you that God wants to show up in every area of your life. Watch Acts 2.42. Listen to this. They devoted themselves. This is after this Acts event, this Pentecost event happened. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone, say everyone, was filled with awe, watch this, at the mighty wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All, everybody say all, the believers were together, and they had everything in common. 
They, watch this. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. There was amazing generosity. Now I understand why some people don't want to give. I get it. Okay? They don't need the help of God. <laughs> I understand why some people don't want to give because they can do life all by themselves. They never need help with anything. They don't need God, as Malachi chapter 3 says, that to rebuke the devourer in their life, everything that wants to devour them and their family. They don't need God to do that. They can handle it on their own. Um, and they don't need any, anything in heaven when they get there because remember, we only have in heaven what we've already sent before we go, our prayers and our giving and things like that. So when they get to heaven, they don't have anything there. They don't need any of that. That's fine. That's why some people don't give. But for the rest of us, we need help. <laughs> And we, and we want to trust God. And so there was this amazing generosity. And they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Only the Holy Spirit can produce that. Because you understand that when the Holy Spirit really touches our life, we let go of stuff. We let go of greed. Okay? And, and we just trust God. So they... Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Notice, temple and house to house. Not one or the other, not just a house. Well, we just need house churches. That's the only thing that we, uh, well, we just need church. No, it was both in the New Testament church. It was the temple and house to house. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. One day, Peter and John, they're going to prayer, and the, and the Jews had multiple hours of prayer. They actually lived their life in prayer. It's interesting that in the New Testament, New Testament believers actually prayed more than over their meals. They actually had a lifestyle of prayer. You say, well, yeah, but they, they, they didn't have jobs. What do you mean they didn't have jobs? They all had jobs. They were farmers. They were carpenters. They were a lot of things. They all had jobs, but they revolved their lives around a life of prayer. And there were specific times when they, they went to corporate prayer and then they had private prayer. And this particular time, it was, it was, in the, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's the hour of prayer and they're getting ready to pray and they're going to the temple and there's this guy, he's over 40 years old. Every day they take him to the temple to beg. He had never walked in all of his life. He hasn't had any muscles in his legs. He's never learned to walk. There's nothing. And, and he looks at uh, Peter and John hoping to get some money. And Peter says to him, silver and gold, I do not have. But what I give to you, I give in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. And the guy jumps up. He's never walked before in his life and runs around. You know, somebody once said, you know, the church can now say we have silver and gold, but we can no longer say rise up and walk. Well, this, this miracle, it, it, it upsets the, the religious people. And the reason is, you know, religious people always get upset when God is doing something because, because God will always offend. I think I told you this before. God will always intentionally offend your religion in order to find out whether or not you really want what God has. And, and when they couldn't be the center of attention, you understand that religious people have to be the center of attention. Well, they're not paying attention to me. And everybody is paying attention to this miracle that has just happened. And Peter takes the opportunity to preach. Then a couple of thousand more people get saved. It says the number was now at 5,000. Well, the religious people, they don't like that. So they, they arrest them and they put them in jail because of this one little miracle. And in the middle of the night, an angel shows up and lets them out of prison and says, go back to the temple and start preaching. So the next morning, they go look for the guys that are in prison. They can't find them. And somebody says, hey, they're back at the temple. They're still preaching. I mean, how do they get out of jail, right? An angel let them out. So they go back, and so they don't cause a ruckus. They said, hey, can you please come with us so that we could talk with you? So they bring them in, and they said, you don't, you're not supposed to be preaching in this name anymore. And Peter says, there is no other, 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 other name given among men whereby you must be saved but the name of Jesus. And they said, we're going to keep doing this whether you like it or not. Well, they said, don't do it. They beat them. They actually scourged them. The same thing you would do before somebody was crucified. Same thing that happened with Jesus. They, they, they beat them. They're bloodied. They're beating, and beaten. And they go back to the prayer meeting. They go back to the house where they were meeting. And watch this in Acts 4.29. Notice what they pray. They have another prayer meeting. Now, Lord, consider their threats. And enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. What do they pray? They pray for more of what got them into trouble. Give us more of this, God. Give us great boldness. 
Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place was shaken where they were meeting together. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I thought they were already filled in Acts chapter 2. They were, but now God is increasing their capacity. You see, every one of us in the room has limited capacity for God until God increases the capacity. You have an unlimited capacity for God. Well, how do you increase your capacity? You have to move things out that are crowding God out. The only way for me to increase my capacity for God is to move stuff out that shouldn't be there so God can move in. And so watch this. All the believers, say all, all. were of one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. You see what the Holy Spirit produces is this massive generosity. But they shared everything they had with great, say the word with me, Power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands and houses sold them. Now, they didn't have to do that, but because they wanted to, they did. They, they brought the money from the sales and they put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to everybody who had needs. So they, they would sell things, they would come and they would give and say, listen, give this to the people that have need. There was this huge generosity that was taking place. They were just giving and giving and giving. I heard about one organization that if you're not there on Sunday, um, somebody comes to your house that week and knocks on your door and asks for your tithe. We're actually getting ready to implement that. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, somebody will take a clip out of this and take me out of context for what I'm saying, just like the news media does. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> All right, we can't go down that road, can we? <laughs> so, so, so this is, this church is rolling forward, folks. <laughs> they are going forward. They went from 120 to 3,000 in a few minutes. Okay. That's when you need to develop a strategy. They had no strategy. They had Holy Spirit strategy. Okay. Now, up to this point, all of their opposition is external. It's all coming from the outside. Interestingly, it's the Roman government. And by the way, you say, well, they don't have it as bad as I do. Did anybody in this room get up this morning and walk out your door for fear that your life was going to be taken? Probably not. They did every day. All this religious stuff going on among them, they, they dealt with religion. They were dealing with a Greco-Roman uh, empire that worshipped all kinds of gods. You think we, we, you, you think we have a, a spiritual problem in America today? <laughs> they had it worse than you could ever imagine. Homosexuality was legal. Taking little children and doing what you, want, what you wanted to do with them was legal. They do whatever they wanted to. And yet the Holy Spirit got in the middle of this, but it's all external opposition. You get the Roman government, you got all the religious people, they're opposed to them. They don't like these people because they're upsetting everything. You know what I pray would happen? I wish that the Holy Spirit would help us and touch us to the place where we'd actually make some people mad instead of accommodate the culture. Now, I don't mean politically mad. I'm talking about spiritually mad. I pray there'd be such a deliverance of the power of God across this region that individuals who are bound by drugs and bound by sex and bound by homosexuality and bound by issues and bound by struggles and sick and in wheelchairs and laying, laying dead, I pray that there'd be such a power of God that will be outpoured in our midst. It makes some people mad, okay? And do make the religious, the religious crowd will always get mad if God does something. Always. But up to this point, this is all external opposition. So, if I'm the devil, now, just, just to help you understand, I'm not. <laughs> just, just want to clarify that with some of you who may be wondering. I, I, I'm not. But if I was, if the external opposition that I was using to try and shut something down and discourage people wasn't working, what would, be my, what would be my next step? I would move from external 
to internal. So let's spend the rest of our time here in Acts 5, and it won't be very long. Acts chapter 5. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, as everybody was doing. You could do whatever you wanted to with that property. You could, you could take the money and put it in 401k if you wanted to. You could put it in a savings account. You could keep it. You could give some of it. You could give all of it. You could do whatever you wanted to do with it. Nobody was requiring anybody to do anything. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. What is he doing? He's pretending that they were giving it all when they weren't, so they could appear to be like everybody else. Here's two people, they're pretenders. They're pretending. They're in church. They look good on Sunday. They sing, they clap. When they go out, they, they take the, the empty offering envelope and they put it in and make everybody think like they're giving. I mean, they're pretenders. Nobody knows it. They want to look like everybody else because that's the thing to do because everybody else, this church is moving forward. It's like this. It's like a train, a locomotive going down a track and nobody is stopping it. I said, oh, we can do that too. We'll sell a piece of property. But listen, what difference does it make? We can say we've given it all. We don't have to. They come to church that day, and Peter says, Ananias, how is it? Now, now, now here we begin to see that this is just more than a money issue. This is a heart issue. How is it that Satan has so filled your heart? Strong language that you have lied to the Holy Spirit. This book is all about the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts is about, it, it's called the Acts of the Apostles, but it is really the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. How is it that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and you've kept for yourself some, some of the money you received for the land? And, and Peter says this, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? After it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? You can do whatever you want to with it. What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to human beings. You've lied to God. When Ananias heard this, boop. <laughs> he fell down and died. <laughs> Look at the next three words. In great fear, <laughs> yeah, seized all who heard what had happened. And according to Jewish tradition, if you died, you were buried in the same day. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. Now, his wife had been texting him, and he wasn't responding. Ladies, how many you text your husband sometimes? He's not responding. Where, where is he? Or maybe it's the other way around. Or maybe you're texting your kids and they're not responding. We know that happens. <laughs> okay. About three hours later, I don't know where my husband is at. Last time I knew he was going to church. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. She hadn't checked her Facebook page. She hadn't looked on Instagram. She'd logged out of Twitter. Peter asked her, I've got a question for you. Is this the price you and, you and Ananias got for the land? Now, it appears here that the reason she's going to give up, get an opportunity here to make it right is this is probably Ananias' idea and she went along with it. 
Look, this isn't part of the message today, but ladies, if your husband's in the wrong, you should call him out. I went over well. Um, <laughs> guys, if your wife is in the wrong, you should call them out. I mean, that's how marriage is supposed to work. Well, I can't say anything. Well, then your marriage is dysfunctional. We'll help you. We got counseling for that, seriously. We'll help you in, to learn communication because that, that could have fixed this issue before it came up. What she should have said is, look, Ananias, this is a dumb idea. So they both agreed to it. Is this the price you got for the land? She had an opportunity right now to fix it. Because God always gives us an opportunity to fix something, folks. Amen. But people that pretend don't want anything fixed. People that pretend say, you know, I kind of like what I'm doing. Okay? Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen. I just want you to get the visual of this a minute. The feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they'll carry you out too. Boop. <laughs> Whoa. By the way, oh, thank God we're under, thank God we're, we're under grace now, not law. This is grace. This is New Testament. This is grace. Can I just get somebody to help me with this visual here? Um, uh, can you come here for a minute? Come here, let me, help, help me for a second. So, so um, I'm just going to pretend, I need you to act for a minute, okay? Because I don't want you to literally die. That'd be a problem. Okay. Um, so, so he's having a conversation. How does Peter know what's going on here, by the way? Well, it's the gifts of the, gifts of the Spirit. There's two things operating here, the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. Okay? And he's got the word of knowledge, but the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge work together, so he has the knowledge about what is taking place, but the word of wisdom shows him what to do and what to say. See, a lot of us get knowledge about something, but you've got to have the wisdom to know what to do with it. Okay? That's the problem with some people. They get, hey, I know something. Well, you need some wisdom to know what to do with it. Okay? Your knowledge doesn't mean anything. You don't have the wisdom to know how to manage it. Okay? So, so here's, here's the word of knowledge uh, about, about what they did with the property, and he says... Uh, the people that carried your husband out are going to carry out your two. Boop, die. Okay, okay good. <laughs> Perfect. Now, 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 that was a quick resurrection right there. Okay, no, it's good. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I just want you to get the visual of this happening in church. Finding her dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And notice verse 11 again. Say the next two words. Yeah. <laughs> like, ooh. Great fear seized the whole church. And about all those that heard about these events. Now, now what is going on here? Like Peter. It's not that big a deal. There are dishonest people all over the place. There are people that don't come clean with God all the time in church, Peter. Do you have to confront everything, Peter? Do you have to deal with everything? There's people like that all over the place. Don't, you, don't need to, you don't need to deal with this, Peter. Just let it go because you're going to cause a problem because these people are big givers and, and there's an issue here. And if you, if you deal with them, you've got a bunch of people going to walk out the door behind them and you just let it go, Peter. It'll be fine. Well, and I read something one time that just put it all into context for me. Israel, right, wanders for 40 years in, in the wilderness. Finally gets to the promised place called Canaan. Look, if some of you feel like you're in a wilderness and been wandering around, you're going to get where God wants you to go. Look at somebody say, you're going to get there. Tell them God's going to give you every promise he ever said. Okay? They wanted a long time, but they finally got there. They're, they're, they're in the land. And, and, but they have, to, they have to do some work, okay? It's not all on God. I know we, we sometimes preach a lazy gospel. Just come. God will do everything for you. 
God's not going to find a job for you. He may open a door, but you might have to apply yourself. <laughs> okay. You might have to have an interview. <laughs> okay. You might have to show up on time. <laughs> Okay. You might have to do a good job. <laughs> well, I didn't get promoted. Well, you're the laziest one there. That's why you didn't get promoted. Okay. You might have to do something to be blessed. Okay. But God will open up the door for you. What's interesting about what God did for them in the wilderness is that God let the manna fall from heaven and it landed on the ground. Listen, God put it within their reach, but he didn't put it in their mouth. Can I say it again? God put it within their reach, but he didn't put it in their mouth. They actually had to get out of their tent, walk out, take off their pajamas, make their bed, brush their teeth and comb their hair, and walk out and pick it up. So they, they've got to conquer this land of, of Canaan, and, and the first city they've got to conquer is Jericho. It's a massive city okay. with actually two walls, an outer wall and an inner wall. The walls were wide enough to run chariots on the top of them. And they got to get inside the city. And so God says, let me give you the military strategy. I want you to walk around the city one time for seven days, but don't say anything. Can you imagine a group of church people not saying something? <laughs> How did that happen? That was a miracle itself. <laughs> they do this for seven days. On the seventh day, they walk around the city seven times. And then, and then God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to shout. Shout. So they shouted, and the wall fell down, fell in on itself. They walked up the wall, went in, and conquered the city. Now, God had said, don't take anything out of that city, the gold, the silver, or anything else. It all belongs to me. You can have the rest of Canaan, but you can't have what's in Jericho. Why? Because Jericho was the first city or the tithe of the land. And God said, the tithe belongs to me. Amen. Okay, you can have the rest, but the tithe belongs to me. So they conquer the city. It's great. They go up to the next city, Ai. Little city, they said. We don't need very many soldiers. They go up and a handful of soldiers defeat Israel. And Joshua falls on his face and begins to cry out to God and he prays and he prays and he prays and he prays. And in Joshua chapter 7, this is what God says to him. He says, the Lord said to Joshua, stand up, stop your praying. Quit praying. And here's the next three words that caught my attention. Israel has sinned. Israel. No, everybody hadn't sinned. No, God said Israel has sinned. You had one guy named Achan. He got inside the city. He said, oh, this looks pretty good. I'll take some of this for myself. Nobody else knows it. He touches what God says don't touch. Okay, because the tithe belonged to God. And then God says, Israel has sinned. Why would God say that? Because here's what we do not understand. We don't understand the interconnectedness of the kingdom of God and the body of Christ. When you give your life to Jesus, I'm connected to you, you're connected to me, we're connected to each other, and what you do affects me, and what I do affects you, and what we do affects everybody else. Say, wait a minute, I can do what I want to do, nobody knows, oh, it does matter, in God's kingdom it matters. Because there's only one blood of Christ. There's not many bloods of Christ. You don't have your own blood that cleanses you. It's all one blood. And that one blood has interconnected every one of us. So what I do affects you and what you do affects me. Not Achan has sinned. No, no, no. Israel has sinned. And they go through the whole process of finding out the individual. And Achan replied, it's true, I've sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I've done. When I saw in the plunder of the beautiful robe of the Babylonians and 
200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold. I said, no, that's pretty good. He went and hid it under his tent. I coveted them. I took them. They're hidden in the ground. Here's the process. I saw, I coveted, I took, I hid. That's the process of your flesh. That's the process of my flesh. I saw, I coveted, I took, and then I hid. You see, this was the issue with Adam and Eve. God comes looking for Adam and Eve, and where does he find them? He finds them hiding. This is what we tend to do. We hide things rather than are open with it. And this stuff's buried in his house, buried in his home. This, let, me, let me say this. It's not part of this message, but I'll say it. It becomes part of the message now. A lot of things that belong to God are in our cars, in our vacations, and our other things. When we should have given to God, we spend it on ourselves. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel, whoa. Then all Israel stoned him. And after they had stoned, after they had stoned the rest, they buried them because it appeared that he had help with his family and other things. We generally don't do stuff by ourselves. We, we have somebody we're joined up with. Over Achan, they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger and therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Trouble. Some of your translations will say the Valley of Achor. That one thing causes an issue that is in the memory of Israel called the Valley of Trouble. Because Achan, not all of Israel, Achan. Listen, if you look through the history of the body of Christ, ladies and gentlemen, and the history of the church, it's not everybody that's done something, but certain people have done things, and it's affected everybody. Because what I do affects you, what you do affects me. That's why God says Israel has sinned. So, if Peter does not deal with Ananias and Sapphira, there is no Acts 6 through 28. It doesn't exist. Oh, they would still do church. They would still do the singing. They would still do the preaching. They would still do the fellowshipping. They would still do the praying. They would still partake of the bread and, and communion and stuff. But the tangible presence of God would lift and the miracles would cease. Because in the New Testament church, there was such a tangibility that the presence of God was so thick that everything was transparent. And people say, well, we want first century power. We want God to show up. We want the miraculous. Yes, everybody does. But do you also want that kind of transparency that calls people out when they're pretending? So Peter deals with this. And watch what happens. The apostles performed, this is after the Ananias and Sapphira issue, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. I got, I got to ask you a question. Is my disobedience worth the lifting of the presence of God on my life in his church? Is it worth it? The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. It was part of the temple area. <laughs> here's, here's something funny, verse 13. Nobody dared join them. Uh, you know what? I am not becoming part of that people because you'll be dead. <laughs> but the irony of it is, even though they were highly regarded by the people, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Those that wanted to pretend stayed away, but others said, I want what you've got. You've got something that I need, and many more people joined up with them. Hey. And as a result, watch this, 
People brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter... Sh now, Peter doesn't know this is going to happen. If he doesn't deal with Ananias and Sapphira, there's no shadow ministry. Doesn't exist. Peter doesn't know that this, this supernatural thing is going to happen. So as he's walking down the street, just, just picture this in your mind. He's walking down the street, and I can see my shadow up here in the lights. He's walking down the street. He's not even thinking about it. Suddenly, as his shadow passes over somebody, people are getting up. They're lame, and the, the sick are being healed instantly because as he's walking, God gives him the shadow ministry because he's willing to deal with the purity of the church. People brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Wow. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those. Here's the first time you start to, to see the word deliverance that makes somebody uncomfortable. You know, well, deliverance, you know, pastor, that's, you know, that's a, no, deliverance, it's a biblical term. There are people that are tormented by stuff and God wants to free them. How, why is that such a big deal? Those tormented by impure spirits. and Say the next word. All of them were healed. Let me ask you one question as I finish today. Do I desire New Testament power and authority? And unity. If the, answer, if the answer is no, it's like, okay, this isn't for you. If the answer is yes, then what do I need to do to embrace and keep the tangible presence of God? You know why youth camps and things are so powerful? Is because you get people off by themselves. You get them all focused on one thing. We take the phones. <laughs> Some people need deliverance from their, from their devices. Seriously, you're addicted. You get people focused all on the same thing. You get them thinking one way, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They're not distracted by how many likes they got on a post. They're just seeking Jesus. Do I desire New Testament power and unity if the answer is yes, and what do I need to do to embrace and keep the tangible presence of God? Stand with me. I was praying earlier this week. You kind of gotten quiet on me, but it's okay because I think you're listening. Is anybody listening still? I know. Are you wanting to, to beat somebody to Outback or something? Uh, it's, just use your app. You can do call ahead seating. I felt the Lord asked me a question this week. And he said this. He said, Will you let me do what I want to do? Now, for some of us who are super spiritual here, oh, yes, 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 I'll look, whatever, just say yes, Pastor. I'm, I'm, I'm not bright sometimes because I feel sometimes like I have a learning disability with God. Seriously, I don't, get, I don't get what he's trying to tell me sometimes. But I know when God asks you a question, you better ponder the question before you give an immediate answer. You say, well, why, why would you have to ponder that question? Will you let me do what I want to do? Because I've been at this for 35 years. And my conclusion was, God, yes, but I don't know that I know how to do that because we're church people and we are in such habits of life and church that maybe God would have to reteach us what he wants and how he wants to do it. Anybody in the room feel like if the Lord will teach me, you say, well, I already know. 
that kind of arrogance will get you nowhere. Anybody feel in the room, if the Lord will help me and show me how, with whatever mistakes I'm going to make, I'm willing to let God do what he wants to do. Anybody feel like that in the room? That was my answer. That's what my conclusioning answer to God because I was not going to answer that question quickly. And, 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 and again, that some of you are probably a whole lot more spiritual than I am. You could have answered it immediately. Bless God. Okay. Somebody said, I want the power of God and the glory of God in the church. Okay, do you also want to deal with Ananias and Sapphira? Because you can't have one without the other. Just wait on the Lord for just one second. And just, can we just slip our hands toward the Lord for just a second? Holiness, Lord, of your church, the purity of your church matters more than our titles, matters more than our reputations, matters more than our positions, matters more than our futures, matters more than our money, matters more than our income, matters more than what people say about us, Lord, I ask you to help me contend for the purity of your bride. I ask you to help me contend for the purity of my own life. God, I pray that you'll put warriors throughout this room to to contend for the presence of God. God, I pray in this moment of time, you'll put something within somebody's heart right now that will contend for what you're contending for, Lord. Now, how many of you in the room need a healing or a touch in your body? Put your hands up right now. Father, in Jesus' name, not simply for the sake of feeling better, not simply for our personal benefit, but I ask you, that you will glorify yourself in somebody's body and mind and spirit right now. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name that eyes that cannot see would be opened, that ears that cannot hear would hear, that legs that cannot walk will be strengthened, that lungs that cannot breathe will be opened, that cancers that are ravaging a body will dry up, and we speak to every physical and mental need in this room. Lord, I pray that you will make this house a place where your glory is welcome to dwell. Give us the courage we need to contend for what you want in your church. And we speak healing, grace, strength, power, unity upon your people today, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.